It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Feeling the presence of God and amen. It is so good. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to just get going here. Um, praise God. Well, we'll see where time goes. So, um, Pastor says, always, you know, speak or preach, you know, what impacts you. And so, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, we were talking about the heartbeat of God in uh, Sunday school. And uh, <clears throat> it really just, it, sometimes you teach stuff, it just comes back and it, man, it just impacts you. And uh, so I don't dream normally, but usually in those quiet times when you've got your eyes closed and your mind just gets going, this just keeps coming back to me, the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat of God. I don't have a title for this. I don't know that I'd call it the heartbeat of God, um, but just this has just impacted, impacted me and uh, definitely want to live for God, amen, to the fullest. So praise God. But um, all right, so just in... Um, an opener here, uh, what does it mean when someone says, I love you with all of my heart? What does that mean? Are you basically, are you saying that I love you with all of my hollow muscular organ that contracts and propels blood through my circulatory system? Right? That's exactly, that's what the OCD people are saying. I love you with all of my heart, all of my blood, and all of my veins, right? Right? No, so you're, you're saying I love you with my innermost being, I love you with all of my attention, all of my desire, um, <clears throat> completely. I love you completely, what we're trying to say, right? So what kinds of things do we do with love when we love with all of our heart? Or, I'm sorry, what kinds of things do we love with all of our heart? That's a tougher question. What kinds of things... Do we love with all of our heart? Well, hopefully you'd say your wife or your husband, right? Hopefully that's one thing you say. <clears throat> hopefully you say God, right? Um, I will say that um, I love my wife. I've been married 18 years. We just recently celebrated our 18th wedding anniversary. So, praise God. Amen. I'm thankful for my wife. I, I appreciate her. I will say that the things that we say we love with all of our heart, we can tend to get a little complacent with, comfortable with, um, just nonchalant, you know, I guess we'll do something or whatever. Um, so I do apologize for becoming complacent. And um, we stop doing those special things that we sh know that we should do to show love. But instead, I do the things to show the other person whom I love with all of my heart. Who's the other person that we love with all of our heart? If you're honest. That's right. It's me. Right? And so too many times we end up showing ourselves that we love ourselves <laughs> with all of our heart. And um, so... How do we know that? We, we, well, what, what kind of things are you doing? What are you spending money on? What are you spending your time with? I mean, the list goes on of how often you show yourself who you really care about. Well, who are you buying things for? Who are you interested in, you know, doing things for? And if the answer most of the time is yourself, well, then chances are you love yourself. Um, one of my favorite, absolute my favorite Bible character is King David. And um, if you know anything about King David's story, you know that he went through a lot. Um, he Bought a lion, killed a bear, killed Goliath. I mean, think about just the Goliath thing alone. He killed Goliath against all the peer pressure of not only his own family, but against the peer pressure of all of the army of Israel. He went out and fought this giant, okay? And um, what it speaks to me is David had a love for God. David had a love for God. Um, he had to flee from Saul many times, and um, he, had, he had committed great sin, but he always turned back to God. But he, in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it said that David had this testimony, that he, he raised up David as a king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Amen. 
Amen. That's where I want to be. I want to be a man after God's own heart. And um, David certainly was this man. So as I read through Samuel, I, I pick up on all these little things that he did that he didn't have to do. Like the time he was running from Saul, who was trying to kill him. David had already been anointed. Saul's trying to kill him. And uh, of course, God delivers Saul into David's hand. David is alone. Well, he's not alone. He's in a dark cave with his men. And Saul comes in to go to the bathroom. And he can't see because he's coming out of a bright lit area into a dark cave. And David is able to walk up to Saul and cut off the corner of his robe without David even knowing it. And then after he did that, it says that his heart smote him because he stretched out his hand to, against the Lord's anointed. And, and, and there was another time where you know, Saul comes out after David again. And Saul, David sneaks into um, Saul's camp and he takes his water bottle and he takes his spear and then he goes back on the other side of the mountain a safe distance away. And he says, examine, you know, whose water bottle and whose spear this is. And again, he didn't kill Saul because Saul was the Lord's anointed. And so David had a testimony that he pleased God. He sought to do whatever he could do to be pleasing to God. He sought the heartbeat of God. And, uh, amen, as... Um, as I lay in sleep, I'm just thinking about all of this and just is just all going through my mind and and just really in a nutshell, am I doing my best unto the Lord? Am I trying to be pleasing unto God? And um, I, I think sometimes, well, honestly, the answer is no, right? Yeah, the answer is no. And um, so, amen. Impact my heart, O oh God. So, if we be, if let me ask you this question: If we began to see what kinds of things have the affection of God, have the attention of God, grab the heart of God, if we began to see those things and follow after those things, how would that benefit your spiritual life? I know that's a big question. I'm going to ask it again, and I just want that to sink in for a second. If we began to see what kinds of things have the affection, have the attention, amen, have the mind of God, if we began to follow after those things, what would that do to your spiritual life? How would that benefit your spiritual life to seek after the things that God has his eyes set on? The thing that God loves. Doing the thing that God loves in your ministry, in your walk. What would that do, amen, between you and God? How would that cause you to grow in God? So if I asked you today, what is the heart of God, what would the answer be? People, right? I think this verse in uh, Luke 4, 17 sums it up very nicely. Jesus is just coming into his ministry. He's just um, gotten past the fast that he did. He was just tempted by Satan. And he, he's handed a scroll and he goes into the temple and he... And, and, um, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is, be is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to, fee to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. That pretty much sums up the life of Jesus, right? The, the, the mission statement of Jesus Christ. And I, I, you know, I just, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that place as he goes back to his hometown with all the people that he knew, you know, his family, friends, you know, relatives, you know, those towns grow because families grow. And so, isn't this Jesus' son? And he closed the book and he said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they, uh, what do you say to that? I mean, man, that, that, just to be there would have been awesome. Amen. <clears throat> Another scripture that sums it up is Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Amen. So it's with that mindset 
the heartbeat of God is to seek and save that which is lost. Amen. That is the heart of God. Amen. Praise God. So the heart of God is saving lost people. He does that because God's core attribute is love. God's core attribute is love. Amen. It goes hand in hand with holy, really. I know God's got many attributes. And I love the way Pastor describes the word holy, that it basically means God is distinct, he's separate, he's, there's nothing like him, there's no one like him. God's love is holy, it's distinct. There's no love like God's love. A mother's love doesn't even compare to the love that God has for you and for those you know, those outside these four walls. God's love is holy. Hallelujah. Amen. In 1 John 4, 8 it says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Hallelujah. God is love. Amen. He loves me. He loves you. Amen. He loves the lost. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to go to Hebrews 1. Amen. 1 through 4. It says, this is just a, this is just a powerful verse. It's a Bible study, so I got a lot of scriptures. So hopefully you've got a Bible. You can go to Hebrews 1. Amen. 1 through 4. It says, God, who at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hast in these last days spoken to us by his Son, <clears throat> whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the world, word of his power, when he made by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What a beautiful name it is. Hallelujah. What a beautiful name it is. Amen. Amen. Can we just for a moment, can we just praise God? Amen. Jesus is the express image of his person. Amen. And that name has been glorified and elevated. Hallelujah. What an excellent name. Amen. The name of Jesus is. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for the revelation. Amen. Of who you are, God. Hallelujah. That you would robe yourself in flesh, God. That you would become love. Amen. In Jesus Christ and express that love to us, God. Amen. You are the express love of God incarnate, God. We thank you. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 3 again says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus is the expressed image of God. Amen. And God is love. Jesus is the expression of God's love for you. Amen. Jesus is the expressed image of God's love for you. If you can't see love, except it's done in expression. You won't know that I love you unless I buy you flowers, unless I take you out to dinner or tell you I love you. You won't know that I love you unless I express that love. God loves you and he expressed that love in the form of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. He took my sins and bared them on a cross. Amen. The glory, amen, the glorious God wrapped himself in flesh. Just think about that. Amen. I've been serving God a long time and every time I try to wrap my mind around a glorious God that would wrap himself in flesh and die so that I can make it, it's an amazing thing. What a beautiful name it is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. So I've said this many times. I say this to our youth group all the time. God loves me. I'm God's favorite. <laughs> Praise God. I'm God's favorite. Amen. I, I still believe that God loves me. Even though I fail him many times. Amen. And even as I wrote this on paper, I began to think of all of the times I failed God. All of the times I've let him down and I've come short. 
and God loves me. How do you know God loves me? Because the times when God shouldn't have heard my prayer, the times when God shouldn't have forgiven my sin, the times when God shouldn't have refreshed me, amen, with the power of the Holy Ghost, he refreshed me. There's times where I've come to God and I just said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And boom, God just fills me with the Holy Ghost. Amen. He restores me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. When I cry unto the Lord, when I fail, he still loves me. Hallelujah. Amen. And I absolutely believe that you're God's favorite. See, a mother can't do that. A mother can't have two favorites, right? You're going to have one favorite or the other. Now, you love all your children, but one's you kind of like a little better. <laughs> the other one, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Praise God. You love your children, right? You love all your children. You want to say equally, but your kids are different. All of your children are different. God can love you, and you can be God's favorite child. And in the same way, he can love me, and I can be God's favorite child. Amen. I don't know how God can do that. How God loves me. And there's times where I don't even have to ask him for something. Just in conversation between us and somebody else, God hears that. Jehovah Jireh, right? He hears that. He sees that. And God provides for us because he loves me. Oh, thank you, God, for loving me. Hallelujah. Amen. And God loves you. Amen. God loves you. Amen. I am... Um, I don't know how to say this. I am not a super spiritual guy most of the time. And um, I think it's really, really corny. I'm being honest. I'm being transparent, okay? When somebody says, Jesus loves you. To me, that is like the most corny thing you could say. Jesus loves you. Well, duh. Yeah, that's like everybody says, Jesus loves you. But I've come to realize that somebody just simply needs to hear that Jesus loves you. He hasn't come to throw stones at you. He hasn't come to cave the roof in of this place on you. Jesus loves you. And I'm telling you, I'm telling me tonight, because I'm talking to myself, there are people out there that need to hear Jesus loves you. As simple as that statement sounds, I don't compute with that sound i i can't explain that to you i don't understand that why it just sometimes it it means something different to somebody else it the words jesus loves you doesn't mean the same thing to me than it might mean to somebody else but i know amen that somebody needs to hear that god loves them amen the mission of jesus has not changed we need to follow the heart of God. Amen. There's a story in Mark, and we talked about this in Sunday school, in Mark chapter 2. And um, I think this pretty well um, just gives us a good idea of the heart of God. But in Mark chapter 2, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start going a direction that may seem weird, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's got a purpose. That at least I hope it does, because it's just been on my mind and just... As I sleep, this thing is just unfolding in my mind, and, and praise God. So I hope this comes out right. So here we go. Um, in Mark chapter 2, um, starting at verse 1, it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. Praise God. Amen. I'm just going to say... If we will get Jesus in this house, this place will be full. If we can just get Jesus in the house, this place will be full. Amen. Praise God. And uh, it says, And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And then when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, 
Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Man, if they only would have known and recognized who was in the room with them because they had the answer to their own question right there. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Guess who's standing in the room with you? And you missed it. Praise God. Jesus. Amen. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytics, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately... He arose, took up the bed, and went out of that presence of them all, and so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus has a love and a compassion for the broken and for the wounded. Jesus has a love for the broken and the wounded. In the story here, I want to point out, there are four types of Christians, if you will, in the room. There's the broken who need Jesus. We will call them the needy for the sake of tonight. The evangelical, those who broke open the, the, the roof. There's the complacent. And there's the Pharisee. Okay? The needy. Obviously, they are the ones who need Jesus, but sometimes they are unable to bring themselves to Him. You will have to bring Jesus to them or you'll have to carry them to him. All right? They are the ones who need to hear Jesus loves you. They are the ones who need to hear Jesus loves you. Now because of that word love, he will heal you. Okay? He wants to heal you and he wants to set you free because of love. There's the evangelical. They're, the emphatic, they're emphatically believing that God will do something in your life if they can just get you to Jesus. He still, they believe that He still wants to help you. He still wants to heal you. He still wants to save you. In fact, they're willing to tear open the roof of somebody's house to get you into the presence of Jesus. Amen. Can you imagine the guts that it took to go to somebody? Can you imagine somebody coming to your house and tearing open your roof? How ticked off would you be? It, you got, now you got to fix your roof. Okay? So these guys had guts, but they had faith that if they could just get them to Jesus, amen, they would see a miracle in this man's life. Amen. And there is so much we could teach here, but we're not getting into all that. On a side note, we can bring people to Jesus for a need to be met. But God knows the real need. You notice when they lowered him down, they, they lowered him down obviously because this guy was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. He couldn't move. So obviously he needs a healing. And now he's in the presence of Jesus in front of all these people and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. Many times we bring people to God and God knows the real need in somebody's life. God knows the real need in somebody's life. And so sometimes we bring people to Jesus and we want God to heal them. And it doesn't happen. And we're going, wait a minute, but God, don't you want to be glorified? God knows the real need. God knows what he's doing. God knows, amen, what to do. But wait a minute, God, I brought them here to be healed. But Jesus says, the greater need is your sins are forgiven. The greater need is your sins are forgiven. Praise God. There's the complacent in the room. These are all believers. If they weren't believers, they wouldn't be there in the room with Jesus pressed in like a can of sardines. They wouldn't be tolerating that, right? Obviously, they're believers. Now, we all believe and we all have doubts. Let's be honest, we all believe, but we all have our doubts in one area or another. So, but these are all believers. 
but they're complacent. They all know God can heal, or most of them, but yet they wouldn't make room for this paralyzed guy. I'm sure that these four guys didn't decide that they're just going to go tear open a roof. They probably knocked on the door and, excuse me, can we come through? Pardon me, pardon me, get out of here. There were some, prop, there were some people in the room that said, you're not getting by me. They were complacent. They were too comfortable just being in the room with Jesus and they missed the heart of God. Why didn't they make room? Well, what about my needs? They probably weren't thinking about what God wanted to do. They weren't thinking about what God wanted to do in this person's life. They were thinking, what about my needs? What am I going to get out of this deal? How is, amen, I want God to speak the word to me. And they weren't willing to make room for somebody else. They're the complacent. There's the Pharisee in the room. Those who question everything and point fingers at everyone else. They're, these are people Jesus, these are the only people that Jesus really rebukes. I mean, he does rebuke Peter the one time, okay? But most of the time, God's rebuke was to the Pharisee, the religious in the room that were always trying to point finger and find fault with somebody else. What are they doing? Why are they doing that? Why aren't they doing this? They're pointing the finger at Jesus saying, how dare you say that? How dare you do that? They're missing out on the heart of God. Now I believe that we can be in any one of these four groups at any given time. I can be complacent today and I can be um, emphatic, you know, an evangelist tomorrow. And then back place and again and then a Pharisee by Sunday okay because of our human nature we get attitudes we get puffed up we question we argue we get comfortable we get complacent this all this I'm, I'm talking about myself tonight okay praise God spiritual battles will come to us all but I know that I am the heartbeat of God For he refills me even when I don't deserve it. Even when I find myself in the wrong group. Even when I find myself complacent, God is always trying to stir me up. God is always trying to call me out of that place of comfortability, right? If that's a word. Is that a word? (laughs) Praise God. Amen. I know that he loves me. Amen. I know that he loves me. How many of you know that he loves you? How many of you know that he loves you? Amen. Would you, just, would you just lift your hand and just say, Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, even when I find myself, God, in the wrong category. Even when I find myself being complacent or just not seeking the heart of God. Even when I find myself a Pharisee, you still love me, God. You have something to say to me, but you love me, God. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. We are the body of Christ. I think we all know this. So this means that we are the extension of God's love to people. We are the extension of God's love to people. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 11 and 12, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for, it's a big word there, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In that first sentence there it says, for the equipping of the saints. Notice there's no comma after that. So the pastors, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers are for the equipping of the saints to work ministry. In the NIV it says it like this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. 
so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. We are the extension of God's love. And God wants to equip you to be that extension. Amen. God wants to equip all of us to be that extension. Help me, God. Because I fail so many times in this area to be the extension of God. The word ministry. And um, again, this is something I tell our youth all the time. The word ministry does not mean person standing in the front teaching. That's not what the word minister means. Okay, It means to be a servant. To serve somebody. Amen. And so the word ministry to me is not to be taken lightly. It's, it's not. And um, so I, I would fall under the category of my pastor as, as a minister in service to my pastor and in service to this body. And I also serve as a youth pastor. It's a ministry. I am not puffed up and I'm not over you as a, you know, putting my thumb on you. I am a servant to our young men and our young ladies. Amen. To bring you into a closer walk with Jesus Christ. That is my job to serve you. Amen. And bring you into God. Amen. And so your job as saints of God is to be equipped by, and I'm getting ahead of myself, by the preached word so that you can do the acts of service that God wants you to do. To do the ministry that God wants you to do. Hallelujah. Praise God. God wants to equip you. He wants to train you to be more like Him. God's attribute is love. God wants to equip you and to train you to be more loving. And honestly, I need work in that area. But that's a whole other topic. To be able, when He asks you to do something, that you're able to do it. That's what training is. At work, I have um, people coming from all over the country to our site and we have to train them and um, so that they know how to go back to their location and they are able to perform the job of a facilities tech or maintenance tech or whatever their job is. But our job is to train them so that when they go back, they know what to do. And sometimes I think that we, let me say this, sometimes I think that I come to church and I'm ready to be a Christian in the house of God. But when I go to work, I have to fit back into a mold where I'm just, I'm here to do a job. But I'm not there to do that job. I'm there to follow the heart of God everywhere we go. And so we come to church not to be Christians here. We come to church to be trained to be Christians there. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To be able when he asks you to do something that you can do it. That's what training is. It's out of love for him. And I just want to throw in there the church in Revelation that got so busy doing the work that God had told them to do that they forgot their love. God said, you, you've left your first love. I've half this against you. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to get so busy being a youth pastor that I forget about why I'm doing this. I'm doing it because I love God. I don't want to get so busy, you know, just teaching Bible studies or doing Sunday school or discipleship or any of those things that I forget about my love for God. Praise God. See, you thought, I thought, the pastor was supposed to do it all. And that, you know, it's his job to go to the hospital. It's his job to, to get up here and teach. It's his job to go over there and pray for you. It's his job to... No. He's trying to equip you to do it. He's trying to equip the saints of God 
to do the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. I don't think I'm out of line when I say that pastor is asked when people stand up that people around them go and pray. And I am I off when I say that you don't want it to be that everybody thinks the minister's job is to go and anoint people with oil? You want the saints to anoint and to pray because God works through you. You are the saint of God and God will work through you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They all have one common thing. Though they all do it differently, they all have one thing in common. So if you want to know what the apostle's job is, what's the prophet's job, what's the evangelist's job, what's the pastor's job, and what's the teacher's job, they all have one thing in common. They deliver the word of God. But we just read that they equip us. Well, how do they equip us to do the work of the ministry? If all they do is just give us the word of God, how do they equip us? In Ephesians chapter 6, we read about equipment needed to be a Christian. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Equipment. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of, his dark, of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand... Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the, breath, the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation the, the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praise God. Clearly, we have some equipment here. We have some equipment here. But do you notice anything in common about all of these pieces of equipment? Truth. The belt of truth. In John eight thirty one, it says... To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Teaching delivers you to truth. It brings you to truth. It's, it's not done through ESP. It's done through speaking. We teach righteousness which is the breastplate in Romans 3:22 it says that righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe but in Romans 10:14 it says how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach unless they are sent? The breastplate of righteousness comes through faith, and faith comes through the hearing of the Word of God. The good news of peace, which is the shoes that we're supposed to put on our feet. In Matthew ch chapter 10, verse 7, it says, As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. Amen. 
We're supposed to put on the, the shoes of peace as we go and preach the gospel of peace. Praise God. But again, it's through spoken. It's spoken. And then there's demonstration. Faith. We already talked about faith, but the faith, which is the shield, says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? In Hebrews 11, um, what is it? Hebrews eleven six says, um, that's it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Praise God. But you can't get faith unless you hear about God first. Unless you hear God loves you. Praise God. Salvation, which is the helmet you're supposed to put on. How can you know about salvation unless Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 has been preached to you? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Salvation, again, is preached. The Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, that one's almost self-explanatory, but in 2 Timothy, Paul admonishes his adopted son, if you will. Timothy, he says in, in chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching, or doctrine, depending on what version you have in your hand, but praise God. He's commanded to preach the word. All of this equipment comes from preaching, comes from teaching, comes from evangelizing, comes from, from prophets declaring the word of God to you. They clearly have a job to do. They clearly have their work cut out for them. Praise God. What about all the rest of the work that needs to be done? Are those all to be left to the prophet, to the pr teacher, to the evangelist? No. Let's follow the heartbeat of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Here is what I believe God is laying on my heart. That God has called us all to do a work. All of us. Every single person here, God has something for you to do. He is equipping you through the word of God to fulfill what God wants you to do. When you search the heart of God and see where or what He wants you to do, do it because He loves you. Well, what if I don't know what God is asking me to do? Let me ask you something. What is it you have a burden for? What is it God is giving you a burden for? Is it cleaning the toilet? Do it because you love God. Is that every time you walk in the bathroom, you see something on the floor and it bothers you because this is the house of God and it shouldn't look like that. Do it because that is what God is giving you to do. He's put a burden in your heart. Is it when you see the sick, it burdens you so bad because they're sick and you want to see them healed. Brother, sister, begin to pray for that person because clearly God has given you a burden to do it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants us to operate in the area God wants us to operate in. Amen. Sometimes we feel like, well, I'm just bringing people to church. It's only one person. It might only be two person. Plural. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like the task that God has given us is so small. How could God possibly care about that little task that I have? And, and sometimes it's, it becomes irritating that I have to do whatever it is that you have to do. And why isn't somebody else helping me do the job that I have to do? We get burdened. 
We get frustrated. We get tired. We get worn out. We change roles. And we go from being evangelistic to being complacent. Why are you bugging me with this? Go somewhere else. Why are you bo- I'm not getting out of you. You go find some place over there to find God. You go find God. I'm not moving out of the way. Or how dare you come to me with that? We become a Pharisee. Help us, O oh God, to operate in such a way as to consider the heart of God every time we do something. And I dare say, if we would begin to think, God, before I do this, what do you think about it? If we would begin to change our mind to operate like that, God, before I go to this place, what do you think about it, God? God, before I watch this on TV, what do you think about this, God? God, before I hang out with that crowd, what do you think about this, God? Man, what would our life be like? So when I asked you earlier, if you would begin to see the things that impact God's heart, and you would seek after those things, how would that change your life? Hopefully this puts a little bit of a light on that for you. In your ministry, whatever it may be, God wants you to be well equipped to do the love of God. Even if your ministry is simply to be a Christian example to this world. Because right now, this world needs a model of what a Christian should look like. Amen? This world needs a model of what a Christian should look like. What a Christian should talk like or not talk like. What a Christian should act like or not act like. That might just be your ministry. But do it with all of your heart to please Him. In Colossians chapter 3, and I'm coming to a close here. In Colossians chapter 3, I think this... I got two more basic scriptures and I'm done. But Colossians chapter 3, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved... Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so must you also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with a grace in your hearts to the Lord. And here we go. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Amen. And then as David would say in uh, Psalms 40 and verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Praise God. I think this has impacted me Amen. In my heart and in my mind, because it's too easy to get stuck going through the motions. I, I mean, we 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 went to North American Youth Congress, and if I could only explain to you what it was like to see thirty-four thousand Christians all in a room praising and worshiping God, and the power that is there, amazing. But then we come home. And we come back to our lives. And we have to go back to work. And reality sets in. And I'm now I'm rubbing shoulders with you know, the world. And all that that means. For whatever reason, we, 
feel like we have to fit back into a mold of normality, if you will. But I know that God wants more from me. I don't know what the more is, but I do know that if I will begin to do whatever pleases God when He asks me to do it, that's more than enough. That's more than enough. Amen. God will take care of the rest. Amen. God will do the rest. So today I'm just simply asking you, are you living for God in a way that pleases His heart? Are you searching after the heart of God in your walk? Are you searching after God for your kids, for your neighbors, for your relatives? Are you searching after God for what you're about to do tomorrow? Is it something that's going to please Him? Amen. And that's how we need to live our lives. Some would say that you, you, know, you need to separate your job from your Christian walk. That's nothing farther from the truth. This works at my job. This works at my job. This works at your school. This works when nobody else is living for God. This works. Praise God.